So, I bet you're all wondering why I gathered you here on this discussion board to watch this video. Well, I'll tell you. Today, we're going to tell you a little about some of the grand monuments and places in the Vatican City in Rome, just across the Tiber from the subject of our last video. The Vatican City is the home of the Catholic Church and the Christian Church in general, and is home of one of the most powerful men on the planet, the Pope. This has been the seat of the Pope for the better part of the time after Christ. It is home to many grand scenes and many mysteries in its walls. It has been made a wonderful place by many artists and architects who have built up the Vatican City and made it what it is today, especially the artists and architects of the High Renaissance and Early Baroque. What we will talk about in this video is only the surface of the myriad of treasures within. One of the most magnificent and well-known places in all of the Vatican is the Basilica of St. Peter. It is the first and most dominating thing you see as you arrive in the city via St. Peter's Square, with its large facade and great ellipsoidal dome. The structure we see today was a long time in the making. The idea for the new St. Peter's started way long ago in 1450 with Pope Nicholas V, and was not consecrated until 176 years later, in 1626, by Pope Urban VIII. The site of the new St. Peter's was built on top of the old St. Peter's, which was built by Constantine in the 4th century. It is built on the site where St. Peter is buried. The idea for the new St. Peter's was started in 1450, but no real plan went into action until Pope Julius II took up the project. Julius was a huge patron of the arts and wanted to spiffy up the Vatican and Rome. He wanted the new basilica to embody imperial splendor and the spiritual drive of his regime. Several architects worked on the basilica, most notably Bramante, Antonio de Sangallo the Younger, Raphael, and Michelangelo. It was started by Bramante who was said to want to pile the Pantheon on top of the Basilica of Maxentius. And he started off with a Greek cross plan. Michelangelo had about the same idea, with some little tweaks here and there. And Michelangelo's plan ultimately worked out for a while, and was built before the Pope hired Carlo Moderno in 1606, when he turned the Greek cross plan of Michelangelo and Bramante into a Latin cross by adding three new bays or chapels towards the obelisk in St. Peter's Square. Now this is funny because the three new chapels slightly follow an earlier plan proposed by Raphael that was shot down. But Moderno had to make these new chapels and he had to make them a little crooked for the front of Michelangelo's building did not line up with the obelisk in the center of the square. So the start of the new chapels is actually very distinguishable between uh, Michelangelo's part and Moderno's part. The interior of the basilica is essentially huge main aisle arches, nested subsidiary vaults, a wide crossing, and the tall drum and dome above the crossing. And the papal altar is uh, right underneath the dome in the middle of the crossing. It is decorated throughout with Michelangelo's pilasters as well as Moderno's pilasters, especially in the three extending chapels. Much of this basilica is made with marble. It is sumptuous in style, enriched with many mosaics, gilded stuccos, and some paintings throughout. One of the later additions to the basilica was by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, in 1624. He designed and executed the Baldacchino, the magnificent bronze canopy that covers the papal altar. It is supported by four beautifully twisted columns. The columns and capitals were made separately and each has a twice life-size angel on top. They are made to create a sense of upward movement as you look at them, like you are gradually looking up to the heavens from the altar of the Pope to the heavens of God. And each column is also supported by marble plinths, which curiously show the Bernini coat of arms several times over, which was a different, you know, sort of decoration at this time. 
Although many changes took place during the long construction of this building, where there were numerous popes and numerous other architects, it still seems to many like a long-flowing, one-minded work of art and architecture. One of the most important places that you can visit at the Vatican is the Sistine Chapel. It is a private chapel of the popes in Rome, and it is one of the glories of the Vatican. It was built in 1473 under Pope Sixtus IV. By far, the best achievements in the chapel are the works of Michelangelo. In March of 1508, Pope Julius II called on Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which was originally blue with gold stars. Michelangelo accepted the commission, even though he considered himself more of a sculptor than a painter, and preferred devoting his time to the monumental tomb of the Pope that he started in 1505. Across the ceiling, he painted nine episodes from Genesis, and they are the representations of the stages of creation, Adam and Eve's temptation and fall, and Noah and the deluge. Below these scenes are the statuesque figures of the prophets and sibyls, with episodes from the Old Testament. The last great work that Michelangelo created in the Sistine Chapel is The Last Judgment on the Altar Wall. Breath goes by Perugino, Pinticero, Botticelli, Roselli, and Signorelli cover the side walls of the Sistine Chapel. These frescoes depict scenes from the lives of Moses and Jesus, symbolizing the reign of law and grace. Since its construction in 1473, the Sistine Chapel has played an important role in the life of the Vatican. Today, it is known to the world as the location that the Cardinals conclave to elect the new Pope. Now, more about the architecture of the chapel. Giovanni Delli Dolci began to construct it in 1473. The Sistine Chapel is a rectangular brick building with six arched windows on each of the two main or side walls of a barrel vaulted ceiling. The chapel's exterior is really drab and unadorned compared to its apartments are two of the three papal apartments and are the ones that we will be focusing on. The Borgia apartments are downstairs from the Raphael room, which is the stanza, were painted by Pinto and occupied by the infamous Spanish Borgia Pope Alexander VI. The apartment suite was closed by Julius II, who refused to live in the room solely by his predecessor and covered all of its frescoes with black crepe Things remained that way in the apartment for 386 years until the apartments were reopened in 1889 to serve as a display room for the Vatican's modern religious art. More importantly, when they reopened in 1889, the Vatican also uncovered the walls and ceilings to unveil the frescoes painted by Pinturio. In recent years, these frescoes have been getting restored and they have released some amazing information. One of the scenes depicts the first European depiction of Native Americans. In the scene of the risen Christ, which is also called the Resurrection, staring up at Jesus is a tiny scene of naked men in feathered headdresses dancing around a pole. What makes these paintings even more amazing is that they were finished just two years after Columbus landed in the Caribbean and just 18 months after he returned to Spain. Some of the other frescoes include the Borgia coat of arms, the dissipation of St. Catherine, the Resurrection, the Visitation, and the Nativity. Just above the Borgia apartments sit the Stanze of Raphael, also known as the Raphael Rooms. Raphael was commissioned by Pope Julius II to decorate these papal apartments called the Stanze. He wanted them to be greatly decorated, just as he wanted St. Peter's to be magnificently built, and Raphael did not disappoint. He makes all the paintings seem like they're in another realm, not just another room. The room which Raphael started with was called the Stanza della Signatura, or Room of the Signatures. It was named after the highest papal tribunal, whose judgments require the Pope's signature. It was decorated by Raphael from 1509 to 1511, and it was decorated solely by Raphael. He left the ceiling as it was, even though it had been started by someone else, and on the walls he built a new layer of brick so he could start the room anew. As is the theme of all the rooms, four in all, there is a large scene on each of the four walls in each room. The vault above each scene is an allegory of each, and the corners are a commingling of the scenes that the corner connects. In this room, 
are depictions of the ideals of Julius II's reign. Poetry and the arts, justice and law, theology, and philosophy. These are also the four major areas of human learning. Each scene is a gathering of sorts by the greatest of minds of each subject. They seem to be meeting to discuss ideas, and there are minds from all different times. This mingling of the people moves away from the usual portraits of each character, singularly. Each scene has its own appropriate setting. Theology is in an open church with an altar. Poetry is on Mount Parnassus with Apollo in the center playing his lyre. Justice is set in a basilica, which can be a church or Roman law court. And philosophy is in an antique hall resembling Roman baths. This room plays off the famous men theme of some similar artists at the time in Rome. Some names appear in these paintings, and others do not. Some we are left to wonder about and guess, which was what we think basically the intention of Raphael. The two more famous walls of this room are philosophy's School of Athens and theology's Disputa. All of this room is fresco and painted in the high Renaissance style typical of the time though with Raphael's little tweaks. This was really Raphael's first big break, and after this room, he soon became a favorite of the Pope. The second room done by Raphael was the Stanza di Eldoro, which was completed from 1512 to 1514, essentially mostly by Raphael also, just like the first room. In this room, the connections between intellectual disciplines moves to a new level of grandeur abstraction. The four walls in this room depict historical scenes that involve divine intervention, thus illustrating the divine protection of the church. To further show the divine protection of the church and the power of himself as pope, Julius and his court are in each scene as witnesses. These scenes come with more drama, and Raphael was up to the challenge of depicting just that. He made the characters more sculpture-like to elaborate on the drama of each scene. These scenes were chosen for contemporary relevance, and in this room, Raphael was influenced somewhat by the buildings of the Basilica, which is shown in the greater amount of shadow and wider values in these scenes. The two more famous scenes in this room are the Mass at Bolsena and the Expulsion of Heliodorus. The Mass at Bolsena centers around doubt. The story goes that a man was struggling with the concept of Christ in the bread and wine of the sacrament, and was having doubts about it. Then, while taking communion, his wafer of bread started to bleed actual blood, and the drops formed the shape of a cross on the napkin he was holding. The napkin now resides in the Vatican as a holy relic. The other story is about Heliodorus who was sent by the Syrian king to Jerusalem to seize the treasures in the temple. He succeeded in grabbing the loot, but on his way out, he was trampled by a mysterious horseman on a white charger, who apparently came at the prayers of the high priest. These scenes were also done mainly by Raphael, which is something the other two rooms we will see lack. The other two rooms of Raphael were done mostly by Raphael's pupils and workshops. The Stanza del Incendino was the more unsuccessful experiment of the final two rooms and was done before Raphael had really mastered the workshop formula that he would come to master because of his newfound large work demands. The Incendio room was done from 1514 to 1517 while Pope Leo X took over and its four walls depict scenes involving other popes named Leo. This room was apparently used as a private dining room for Leo and his companions. The final and biggest room is the Sala di Constantino. It seems to have been used for banquets and receptions for foreign dignitaries, and it could also have been used for other important ceremonies like wedding receptions. The design of the scenes in this room are still, we think, all Raphael but the execution of the room was done mostly by his workshop and was much better executed than the previous incendio. This room was made from 1519 to 1525, 
so it was mostly made after Raphael's death in 1520, and it is partly oil and partly fresco. This room depicts the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine to the Christian faith and his apparent donations to the papacy of certain privileges only held by Roman emperors up until that time.